Thank you guys so much for being here. My name is Andrew Iden. Um, I'm a uh, co-author of a graphic novel called March, but um, in this instance, it's really great to be up here moderating this panel with uh, such esteemed uh, cartoonists and, and journalists. Um, so I'm just going to run down and tell you who everybody is, but I assume you guys have a good sense. But we've got Amy Dijon on the far side, um, studied animation in Rotterdam, Ghent in Paris, but her biggest love was always comics, and after years of making daily cartoons for a newspaper, she decided to quit to pursue her dream. Her debut was the return of the Honey Buzzard, uh, about the traumas of a bookseller, and it became an international success, winning the Prix Saint Michel, um, and a feature film came out two years later. Um, her other books are Europe's Waiting Room, uh, Blossoms in Autumn, and her new one is Taxi Stories. Uh, the next project will be Days of Sand. Uh, which is a graphic novel about a photographer working during the Great Depression. Uh, to her left, we have Ted Rall. Who... Man, what do you want me to say? This is a long bio. <laughs> just read the flattering shit. I got like 600 words of it, so we'll just go with... Um, his most recent book is a graphic novel uh, biography of Pope Francis, but you probably know him from his books. Uh, Snowden. Um, and, Bern, uh, and his Bernie Sanders book, um, and then to Afghanistan and back. Um, he's been a cartoonist for just about everybody. Um, worked in syndication, has been an editor, um, and is just a prolific cartoonist and fantastic. Um, to his left, we've got Jerome Tubiana. He's an independent journalist and researcher, an expert on conflicts and migrations in the Sahel and the. Uh, Horn of, Horn of Africa. He is the author of several books and many art, articles, notably in the London Review of Books, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Le Monde Diplomatique, and 21. His first graphic novel, Guantanamo Kid, um, was written uh, with former Guantanamo Bay detainee Mohamed El Garani and illustrated by Alexander Franck, uh, endorsed by Amnesty International, published by Self Made Hero. Uh, and then we've got Josh Kramer, who I've known for many years, uh, who's an all-around good human being. Uh, I can't vouch for the rest of them. Is a cartoonist, journalist, and all-around nonfiction comics evangelist living in Northeast Washington, D.C. Uh, his comics and writing on cities and other projects have been published in publications including the Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Guardian. And in 2017, he was named a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan. Um, his projects include the cartoon Picayune, Kojo List, Summer House. He has a new zine uh, about housing and transit policy debuting this weekend. <laughs> so, um, thank you guys all, and, and thank you, um, and lady, guys and lady, um, for being here. This is a fascinating topic to me because we're living in the day and age of what the hell is a fact, right? And, and you're operating at the, the forefront of it. Um, so, I want to start very generally, and, and please, let's make this a conversation. I don't want to be the guy giving you two minutes like this is testimony or something. Um, how do you first choose your topics, right? What is that lightning strike that makes you decide you're going to spend years living with this particular piece of information? Um, so Amy, could you get us started? Yeah, I, I think it's, I don't want to sound like Marie Kondo, but you need that spark. <laughs> <laughs> you need the spark to, it's like you say, you work on this a graphic novel um, and it could take years. It could take two years, three years, maybe longer. Um, and it's no use working with a subject that, that just, um, I don't know, that, that you're really not interested in anymore after a while. And somehow, I don't know how it works, but somehow I can really feel it immediately when I see something or when I read something and it just, I get this like burning desire to do something with it. And it's really hard to explain what it is. Um, but for example, I, so I did this taxi book and that was just one conversation with the taxi driver and I thought, well, I need to make this into a book. And that was it. And I can't really explain how that works. <laughs> it's a hard question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the okay. example of uh, the Supreme Court judge who was like, I can't tell you what pornography is, but I know I'm gonna see it. Right? Potter Stewart, yeah. 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 I'm the right panel for that <laughs> um, Yeah, no, we all keep going. I mean, seriously, this is, I think this is a big question for all of us out here where, um, especially when you get prolific and you, you really start to get into the weeds. I got something. Uh, so I don't have a graphic novel under my belt, but I'm a freelancer and I 
you know, I have to keep generating content, as <laughs> cynical as it sounds, to make a living. And so uh, for me, that happened in kind of two phases, was first over the course of years, teaching myself to kind of notice what's interesting to me and to other people and what might be a story. And then um, more than that later, it's kind of what's not just an interesting topic, but what is like actually a story? What is a narrative? What is something compelling that will people will want to read? It's not just like fact after fact. So, yeah. I generally have faith that I'm not unique. Um, I think that if I'm interested in something, the odds are a substantial number of other people will be interested in it too. Maybe not 80%, but anyway, enough people to maybe make a project or a book bible. So I, um, so I kind of follow my muse, whatever it tells me is interesting, um, I pursue. And uh, when I get to the point where I decide that something is no longer interesting to me, I drop it like a hot potato. Um, right now, I'm dealing with that. I have this assignment. I have a book contract. I already spent the advance. But I'm going to probably have to return it because uh, it, it's boring the shit out of me. It's way too much work, and nobody's going to buy it. So, like, fuck it. Oh. <laughs> right. So, uh, I'm a journalist, and when, when I started, uh, the, the thing I wanted to do was to travel to some places that I found more attractive than others. And so I was just looking at what was happening there and what could I propose to newspapers as a freelancer. And then you propose 10 stories and only one is taken. And then also you go on the spot and you spend time and you start becoming a specialist of some places. And for me it was more Sahel, Sahara, part of Africa. And then you also uh, begin, to be, begin to be more an uh, expert, also not only in the places, but in finding what's interesting for, for the readers, for the newspapers, for the editors, for the publishers. And then I also started to be, become a kind of specialist in long-form stories, but also more individual stories, like life stories. Somebody is telling you his life story. And that's, that's very much this. The Guantanamo book is, is the story of one Guantanamo prisoner. And it's not just any prisoner. He is quite exceptional by character, by his, by his life, by his story. And so um, the story, actually, I didn't get it or by myself, it's another uh, journalist and, and writer uh, from actually an American writer from Chicago who contacted me uh, asking me, well, because I was working a lot in Chad where uh, this prisoner of Mohammed had been released uh, in, from Guantanamo in 2009 and I was there and this journalist wanted to write this story and asked me, uh, well, do you think it's a good story? Can you check around? Uh, is it possible to meet him? So I checked and I told him, yeah, it's a good story, not easy to, to meet him, but it's a really good story. And then he, he gave up doing it and gave the permission to do it. And so it was really nice. And, and, and well, that was 10 years ago. And then, well, I grew up as well and, and kind of became a bit better and, and more instinctive uh, at really knowing, okay, that's a good story. And now I would say it's not so much, you don't choose that much, your it's now topics are choosing me. Like, you know, so even some in, in Africa, some some people I don't know are coming to me and telling me, well, I know you are <laughs> looking for good stories, and I am a good story. And it really it works. Like <laughs> I have my next stories will be published soon. is is a story of somebody who was my assistant, and uh, we were stuck in a. I, I had been arrested by the Chadian government, so we were stuck together in an interrogation room, and I didn't know his personal story. But he started to tell me, well, you know, I, I know you like good stories, but, and I have been a jihadist in Mali. Uh, incidentally, accidentally. Well, I said, well, that's a good story. We have plenty of time waiting for these people to get us released. So I got a story in place. So really, stories start to come to you, and you start to be very instinctive, like pretty good at uh, instinctively knowing that's a good story. So now I'm working still on this kind of story. I've been working on migrant stories i gone from Africa to Europe in the last uh, two, three years. And so my, probably, I hope my next book will be a kind of collection of very strong individual migrants to us. That's um, moving and interesting. Um, let me bring it back to a granular level. When you witness a historic thing, when you're not just telling someone else's, but when you're actually the reporter on the ground, 
can you all walk me through your process, both creatively and analytically, from taking the thing that you see happen? How do you, or in some cases, are you drawing it as it happens? Are you writing it down? Are you keeping notes? What is the process for processing that information into a graphic narrative? And, and how does that influence what actually makes the page? Um, Josh, you want to start? Yeah, I can talk about trying to get that first draft of history and trying to make sense of stuff as it's happening, more or less. Um, I did a story recently. I can see my editor in the room <laughs> for the story, uh, for the nib about um, the Venezuelan embassy here in DC. And um, there was a huge protest going on inside the embassy and also a counter protest across the street. And I came into this not really knowing too much about it. Um, and I just kind of arrived on the scene talking to strangers and who did not really want to talk to me. And it was a kind of a thing over the course of hours and days of, you know, having, uh, convincing people that I was an honest broker and trying to figure out what was going on, both where I could get to and where I couldn't get to. And, um, you know, it wouldn't have been fair to that story in that situation if I just told it chronologically or also just my experience of it chronologically. I really had to, in a pretty short, time frame, sit down and consider everything that I knew and try to make sense of it for the reader in a way that I thought was a good representation of everybody's point of view. So um, that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind is uh, sometimes it's not as straightforward as what happened and what happened next and what happened after that, for me anyway. What do you guys think? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm also a writer and a columnist, so I tend to, my methodology is Straightforward journalism, I think that any normal a prose reporter would do. Uh, I take photos, I interview, I take notes, I record interviews, I source everything as well as I can. And, um, you know, I think of, like, for example, two moments that probably I would be, you know, if I, if I died right here on this stage, what would be in my obituary if there were one. Um, I was in a cafe in Islamabad in 1999 drinking a Coke uh, with a friend, and the shooting broke out down the street, and we raced over to see what was going on, and it turned out that General uh, Pervez Musharraf was taking over Pakistan, and uh, that was our story. Um, we literally um, blundered into a, uh, one of the more important coups in recent history. So we took photos, we interviewed soldiers, we talked to people, we recorded it. Um, I called up my uh, friend who's an editor at the New York Times and um, went over it with him. And, uh, but basically it was like the process was exactly the same. And uh, when I did comics journalism about it, um, I, what I filed was quoted, it was sourced, it was fact checkable, it was you know, just the normal process. Um, but sometimes you can't, for example, source everything the usual way. Like uh, I, uh, in Afghanistan uh, in 2000, I witnessed a stoning, a kind of high-profile stoning of a, a murderer and rapist. And um, you know, in, uh, under the Taliban, um, photography is forbidden. Um, I have a funny story to tell about that if we ever have time. But anyway, uh, you can't, you couldn't take photos in Taliban territory. Um, I think you'd be shot. So uh, you know, at that point, well, it's like they're kind of like the you know, you can't source everything. So, you, but again, you take notes, you write, you draw. And in that sense, comics journalism is very useful in a country like that because people will let you draw them, even though figurative art is usually banned under Sunni Islam, but they will let you draw because whatever. And they think it's fascinating, but they will not let you take their photos. So you can document things. So I, t I think just you know, old-fashioned tools are kind of like the best approach. Yeah, I, so I never make any drawings in the field because drawing just takes so much time. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a creator. I, I want my drawings to look good. You know, if I just, I'm in the field standing up and I'm just drawing something. I mean, nine out of 10 times, it doesn't look like anything. And I would never s submit that to a newspaper or anything. Um, but what I do is, is I record conversations because I always feel bad if I'm talking to someone and I'm, just looking at them and then writing down and looking back and I mean that's just so strange to me so I just either with my iPhone or just a recording device I put it on the table and I just have a normal conversation with people and they don't even know I mean of course they know I'm recording it but they don't feel like I'm 
like actively writing their story down and I feel like they are more open to me that way. Um, and what I also try to do if I interview people, I try to come back a couple of times because I feel like if you, I mean, if it's possible at all, of course, but if you try to get someone's life story in 10 minutes, I mean, they're just going to give you the basic story that they tell everyone. But if you come back two or three times and you get more personal and they start, you know, trusting you, you will get the better stories and more details and maybe even things that they never told anyone, which happened a couple of times. Um, so I feel like this, this trust thing is, is really important. Um, I was reminded of this method by a, a book that I'm doing now, which is about dust bowl photography in the 30s. Um, so I was researching this photographer, Dorothea Lang, it was amazing. And one of the things she said in, in her interviews was, I never steal a pho photograph. So what she means is she never just goes up to someone and clicks. <laughs> She has a conversation first, she starts to explain why she's making these photos, and then maybe after an hour, she says, like, can I take a photo? And then she does it, but she never steals a photo. And I thought, well, that's really like the way I work, so I never steal a drawing <laughs> or a portrait. Um, yeah. That's great. I found it's a bit, it's a bit obvious, except I don't draw, but first I also use my memory. I'm not that good an observer and I don't have such a good memory, so I'm taking lots of notes. But for me, the most important is, and I'm also taking photographic like as, as, as not taking, but also as, as like real photography. It's part of my work. But, and, then, and then, well, I'm putting never into this torch and I'm the next picture. I've been taking a lot of time uh, to take each picture and to take notes as well. And uh, for me, the, the the, the most interesting is not that much when I'm there, even if I spend some time. It's not really what's happening in front of my eyes, but it's more listening to people uh, on what happened before, during not only one short moment, days or weeks, but during many years, it's life stories. And uh, so for, yeah, I need their memory, and then a lot of fact and cost checking. But so it's mostly doing really, really long interviews. And, and like, this book is, is like, probably only you know, three weeks of interviews hmm. in, in two moments, uh, uh, separated by several years. So it's, it's a lot of manual. And I'm, I'm pretty good at, not that good at observing, but pretty good at uh, taking very quick notes of everything. Like details, you know, like uh, somebody, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking uh, another direction, not replying the question, or just uh, getting asleep or whatever, you know, every small thing. And they would be useful later, not not essential, but useful to create an atmosphere and, and when you start writing. And, and that brings me to this next question. First, just to be totally honest, I'm building a thesis here because just coming from Mark, in my own experience, I feel like there's always this question of like, is that journalism? Is that, and, and um, I hate that question. I mean, I don't hate many things, but I hate that question. <laughs> Um, and, and so, you know, one of my experiences was that we weren't allowed to put sources in the back of March. Our publisher said, no, you can't do that. And we wanted to do like a big explanation of where we got everything from. So I guess in that vein, as you're doing this, you're talking about how many different sources you're using and how they're all coming together. How do you convey that then to the reader, either in print or in a multimedia uh, landscape? Like, what is it you found the best way to then explain all of these sources um, that you're using in your creative process. Um, who wants to go first? I got some like that one. I saw a lot of eager faces <laughs> on that one, so. I'll go first. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, so I do these um, uh, graphic novel format, nonfiction biographies of uh, figures like Edward Snowden, Pope Francis, uh, our beloved leader Donald Trump, and uh, uh, Bernie Sanders. And um, they're all footnoted. So every page has footnotes, so you know where every quote came from, whether it came from uh, a newspaper or uh, I interviewed the person personally or whatever. Um, so it's just, you know, it's very straightforward. It's like you know where it came from. It's like an academic book. Um, and I think, but obviously, like you said, in multimedia, you can do links. Um, I, uh, and that's true in comics journalism, too. And, uh, do you have any other examples of this that you feel like you've done really well that, that really elicited the reaction from people when they went and saw the depth of your reporting and your sources? I think what you get is the best reaction is no reaction, which is to say people don't think you're, you're, you're fucking 
full of shit and lying, right? They like they're like, oh, well, we're, you know, how do you how do we know this is true, right? How 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 do you know this statistic is right? Well, it's like click the link and then they do, and like, oh, yeah, it's and that's like, great. It's you don't hear from them. It's awesome. It's not your fault if they don't believe the Bureau of Labor Statistics or whatever. Exactly. Like, you do your best, but yeah, um, I think the one area in which comics journalism has not caught up to the rest of journalism is that, like, uh, online prose journalism is so well um, hyperlinked and it's so like dense and it can be really meta. Like we've all kind of seen over the last ten years, it's there's that thing that journalists do where if they're trying to show that there's a lot of something, they will link to like every word in a row, right? There's nothing like that in uh, visual uh, media yet, like anything in comics journalism. Um, there's, there was something like that a long time ago called like Thing Link and it's broken now, it doesn't work. But um, the best, I do, you know, most of my journalism is on the internet. So I think about this a lot. And the, the closest thing we have is maybe like a link to a Medium page where like every article you looked at is linked to, but um, that's not really great. It's not ideal. It doesn't like fit seamlessly into the work. So I don't know. <laughs> well, 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 I'm not gonna let you stop there yeah. because in the back of Housing Transit, yeah. you yeah. do a very good job well, thanks. of laying out the different sources there. So yeah. could you speak a little bit about how like when you put it into print, that's a different set of challenges? Sure, yeah, and I think like we all have different values in journalism and for me personally, like humility and transparency are kind of up there at the top. And so I think it's better to over explain and let people decide that they're not gonna pay attention to it. Like I like to lay it all out for the reader and um, you know, like I have pages of, of places that I got the information from in the back of this, you know, mini comic, uh, this black and white mini comic, but I also have you know, bit.ly links if you want to go to Medium and get the whole thing. So um, I think it's good to make, does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 but then for Amy and Jerome, I mean, you guys are doing so many interviews as well. Are you putting these interviews out there and is there a standard for uh, dealing with your subjects? Like, are you saying like these are interviews that I may publish or is it something you keep more to yourself and then just sort of trust the reader the, for your representations or keep it in the event that it's been questioned or something? Um, well, for me, I, I don't put any sources in the... So in the, I did a journalistic comic about the refugee camps in Greece. Um, and this was really a comic where I was basically telling my day-to-day -day in that camp. I was there for seven days. I spoke to people. But, you know, I have hours and hours of recordings of those interviews, but I don't put them all online because, you know, half of it is just conversation making. It's not even interesting. Um, and as I was doing the comic, I was already selecting the parts that it was, were interesting in the comic, but also the parts that worked for the storytelling. Um, and I really asked myself, like, are, really, are people so interested in this that they would actually listen to the whole interview or read the transcript? I, I don't believe they are. Um, and I think what, you, what you're saying is true, that the reader should just trust you with choosing the right information. Um, and that's a big thing. I mean, you can have a whole panel about that, <laughs> whether we can trust the writer or the artist. Um, but that's usually how I work. And also for the taxi book, I did, well, I did these interviews without any recording devices because I was in a taxi, in the back of a taxi. Someone was driving me and I had a conversation with them. And at the end of the ride, I thought, this is interesting. I'm going to make a note of this talk. But then the talk was already over. So people just need to trust me that this is what happened. Um, and if they don't, that's fine too. Um, I mean, in the end, I'm the only person in the world who knows what really happened. Um, but I can, I mean, I can tell you that it, it is what happened. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's that's usually how I work. I just hope people trust me enough. Um, well, I'm just trying to understand this the standards and help mm -hmm. everybody else understand that like this is a medium that's figuring itself out. Yeah, but it's really complicated, right. really, because I I know I struggle with this question when I read graphic journalism. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. well actually, uh, in, in that book, there, there are appendixes with, with uh, sources, uh, not many not all, but a bunch of them, and uh, web links, uh, as well as a bibliography. But it is just because it's a book. I will not be able to do that in, in a long form piece, a written or, or, or graphic novel. So, uh, but because it's a book, we, we, we want people, it's not only to, to refer to people or convince them 
Just we want them to go further and read all the things which have been material, whether it's true or not. Because some of the sources are actually uh, uh, reports on Guantanamo by the US administration, and they're full of fake information, including about Man, uh, telling uh, he'd been when he was six years old, a member of an Al Qaeda cell in, in London, where, where he's never been. I hope my readers will not uh, believe in these documents and will believe in, in, in my work. But if they want, these documents are there too. Not only what, what graphic models allow you to do as well, which Tourism doesn't really allow you to do, is we inserted documents within the graphic model. Uh, actually, we, we didn't insert them as, as facsimile, but uh, after Alexander the artist, he, he redrew them completely. So to adapt to, to the style. But to me, that's not really, and it's not only to refer to them, it's because we want to show that this is a real story. But to me, the, the difficulty is a bit elsewhere, and maybe this is more of a European perspective, but uh, uh, in Europe, there are really many, maybe too many graphic models, uh, and maybe too many journalistic graphic models, but they are not, there are no standards, and they, are, they, are not, they don't all abide by some rules. Uh, remember, I work as an artist, and is is moving uh, back and forth between fiction and non-fiction, and for and it's a genre in the making as well, very experimental. So I would say uh, maybe half of, the, of those which are published include things which are not totally accurate uh, because uh, there are uh, parts are missing, information is missing, documentation to draw them are missing. Uh, and so sometimes uh, characters will be created uh, and artists will, I, we could talk more about that, I think it was very important to me, but very often my artists will, will tell me, oh, but in a fiction it would be better to do like that. Mm -hmm. And I would have to tell you, well, but that's what is not interesting, mm -hmm. it's what I don't want to do. So I think this graphic novel is probably maybe uh, one of those which goes to the extreme, uh, or more, most radical, uh, Extreme, uh, extremity of the, of the genre, is that I imposed uh, him that uh, uh, this, uh, we, we should be absolutely accurate about everything. So, uh, let's say abiding by the most, uh, by the journalistic rules, rather than by, by the comics rules. Mm. So, but it was easy to do somehow, because Mohammed, the character, uh, first is a very good storyteller, and he remembers everything very well to the point that when he tells the story, he, he remembers the dialogue he had with the Guantanamo guards. And they're sometimes very funny, actually. So he, he's uses, he uses this, their languages. So we didn't need to invent the dialogue, as, as many other authors had to do, because, you know, uh, comics, they use dialogues. Uh, but we didn't need to invent them, because he remembered them. Uh, so it was quite easy. And also, he's alive. Some people work on, 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 on real people, but who died. He's alive, so I, and we are still in touch. So if I want to check anything, I just can call him. So it's it's, but it's also because I wanted to, to 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 abide by these rules that we could do it. And you you raise a fantastic point. I'm going to diverge from, from this timeline I wanted to go through. But um, in, in my own experiences with Marx, there's definitely that moment where someone was editing the script and said, "Well, could we have Robert Kennedy say something here?" And I said, no, because he didn't say anything, right? And, and this idea that um, what makes for good comic storytelling uh, is, is not, we don't necessarily have enough facts to do that, right? Um, or we don't have the dialogue that is the right dialogue. How do you, as a creator, bridge that gap then when you're starting to get into the stories? Right? Like, like, is it just you pull all the way back? You can't do the voiceover narration the whole time. Like, what are tricks? And, and storytelling tactics that you use to, to fill those in. Amy, you gotta go first. Then. Okay, okay. Uh, well, it's a really good question. I remember with that, that refugee story that I did, which was about 25 pages, so it was, it was too short for a book, but we published it all online. Um, uh, I remember going into the office of the newspaper to present the work, and I said I was, I was still sketching, so I was struggling with what should I use of this three hour long conversation and what shouldn't I use. And I don't want to like bend the truth, I just want to select the things that, that make the story work. And I was really struggling with that because I wanted to do justice to these people who told me their life story. Um, and I told this to the editor at the newspaper and he said, 
congratulations, you're a journalist now. <laughs> and I thought, okay, so this is, this is actually true. You're, as a journalist, you need to select the things for your piece, whether it's a comic book or a journalistic piece for a newspaper or even photography, because a photographer goes into the field and has a thousand pictures, but there's only one you can send out to the newspaper. And I feel like that's a very important part of the process. It's not just making those photos or those pictures, but it's selecting and also deselecting this stuff. Um, and I'm still very, uh, very much struggling with that. I mean, that's so hard and you feel guilty all the time. I mean, I feel guilty for certain stories that I didn't use. Um, and in the beginning you're like, oh, maybe I can use this for another book, for another story and make it up to them. But after a couple of years, that goes away, and you're like, yeah, this is, it's just one part of the story, and the rest, I'm sorry, is, is not going to be used, because that's how journalism works, I think. Um, not sure if I'm addressing the question, but no, it's, it's, it's exactly really, it is, um... it's, it's true that a comic book, it, the format of a comic book, and a good story, and the three-act story, and all that, doesn't always apply to an interview, or a, a journal, like the facts of what happened, etc. Um, I guess you just need to go with your gut feeling and, and find a balance between what is readable and what does justice to those people. But it's an ongoing struggle for me, for sure. Yeah, um, I don't know about you guys, but I, and I try to do this less and less as I try to make compelling narratives with real characters, but I find myself often kind of leaning on the third person omniscient narrator, like, you know, the prose, like if you're reading an article or a book, uh, because if you've only got 25 panels or something, like sometimes you have to be able to just say a hundred years later and you don't wanna, like you don't have the comic space to like show that time has passed or whatever it is you're trying to get across. Sometimes you need the like, you know, concise abstraction of words to just do the job for you. But yeah. Um, generally, uh, generically, I always try to rely on direct quotes, but Sometimes not, and, I, and uh, it's, for example, in the long-form uh, graphic novel biographies of people like Edward Snowden, about whom very little was really known when I wrote the book. Um, it's actually still the only biography of Edward Snowden in print, um, which is weird, and I wrote it because I wanted to read one. I waited two years for one to come out, and I was like, all right, I guess I'll draw it, I'll write it myself. So the, but you know, I think the signal is you can, there's, there's signals to a sophisticated reader that they're reading something that is not a direct quote. I mean, first of all, if they go back and look, they'll see in the footnotes of the book that there's no direct quote there. But let's say, for example, it's, it's kind of like an editorial cartoon to, tool. If you have like Donald Trump saying something in an editorial cartoon, like, uh, you know, kill all the Iranians, all right? Well, he didn't need to really say that. Or let's say, you know, to hell with the migrants. He didn't need to say that. Who cares if he said it? It's a, the question is, is there a greater capital T, drop shadow T truth to what that, that quote, that pseudo quote is in that balloon? If so, then it's good enough. It doesn't have to be an exact word for word quote of what the president said, for example. So I think you need to signify it, but it's, you can Do you have a, do, I, just for everybody, is, do you have a hard and fast rule in your work that Everything that's in a word bubble is a real quote that somebody said. No, you yes, yeah. you know. Definitely not. Oh, okay. okay. I'm more no, or less. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. So that's that was my point before. I could I could do that because I am the matter, mm -hmm. and the ability also to call the person to cross check easily, or to correct, or to delete, or to the, the role I imposed to 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 the artist was that uh, you you can't add any word. You can withdraw. You can edit. It's like when you do a documentary movie. You shoot your, you shoot your, uh, your footage, uh, and you can edit it, but you cannot invent it. It's what's recorded is recorded, what's not recorded, you will never get it. It does not exist. So that, that was the rule. The, 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 the second, uh, the, the, and I, as I said again, there was no blanks to be filled, so which is easier. But also graphic novels and comics can be pretty good if you have a real problem, if something is missing. There is a way also to, to stage or edit in a way you, you don't feel the black. Uh, you can be elliptic, you can be symbolic, 
and people know the difference between a symbol and, for instance, in the book we have like a giant hand symbolizing both the same and the uh, inequality, the differences, the, the, une the unevenness of the, of the guard's behavior. Everybody knows that the end is not a real end, it's a giant, but you can use it. And it's explaining something which has not really been told, not that explicitly. Uh, so... This goes back to standards, right? I mean, yeah. we've got totally different viewpoints on how we quote people. Mm -hmm. I think in, in my own experience, the challenge was, you know, we would have quotes, but then we would also have people who would say they remembered the quote, right? And I think you're going through that too, where you're talking about the, the guards, and they're sort of relaying that whole conversation to you, but it's still a second level quote, it's not a first level quote, right? right? And like, how, how are these standards going to develop? And we're, we're largely at the forefront of just trying to figure this out, but uh, what are the yeah. pros and cons, of, and where do you think, how do we develop that as a, as a universal standard so that the reader has the tools going into the work to know what is, what is what? Yeah, I think part of the problem is that we're all like artists and no one wants to make rules, right? Like no one wants to say you have to do it my way or you're, yeah, you're like you're being unethical if you don't like do it exactly the way that I say that everyone should do it. But um, people have been trying to work on this for like at least a decade or so. And um, I apologize because I don't remember his name, but there is a European grad student a few years ago who did a master's thesis on like standards for comics journalism. And what he landed on was that everybody should use like a new kind of symbol to show whether you're talking using a direct quote, like a primary source, a secondary source, like, you know, yeah, exactly. But like, that's probably too much, but maybe there's something in the middle, right? I don't know, we haven't gotten there yet, right? Like no one's really landed on something that everyone can agree is like the way that everyone should do it. I don't think there should be any rule. That, 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 that was a personal rule because of, that's what I wanted to try. It was funny to try it. Is it possible to make a book? without uh, inventing any word, a graphic novel, including the dialect. It was just funny to do, actually. It's, it's an exercise as well. Uh, maybe on another story I would not be able to do it. But I think the important is not to have rules, it's just it's to be transparent and honest, is that if you invent a character, for instance, somehow I think the reader has to, has to know that it's an invented character. But I still have some people who are telling us, is it a real character, or did you, did you invent a Guantanamo character made of di based on different internal characters. So some people, because it's a graphic novel, maybe, some people still you know, have doubts and don't get it, you need to explain somehow. But to me that was not that much the, 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 the main uh, problem, what was actually to try to convince the, the artist to abide by these rules uh, and to give up uh, fiction, uh, perfect fiction versus imperfect but more interesting non-fiction. So for instance, uh, uh, there was an example, I mean, uh, when we had a little struggle, uh, I asked the character Mohammed to tell us some of the stories Montanamo Dayton's were telling each other. He told four of them, and uh, we picked one, the, the one we preferred. We could have made two, but well, space and so on. It's an animal tale, basically. And so, uh, Alexandre, the artist, uh, it's a story Mohammed and uh, he was, he was telling stories with uh, an, an older Guantanamo Dayton, a very famous one, a British resident, Shakira, just released very recently. And so um, they were exchanging stories. And basically, Alexander told me, well, in a good fiction, uh, the old one tells the story to the young one. That's classical. And uh, Mohammed and I said, no, that's not possible. Mohammed said, this is a story I was telling to Shakira. And, uh, but I have another story Shakira was telling to me, but not that one. So okay, we, we, we went with the, with the real story, uh, and we had Mohammed telling, him to, telling it to Shakir. And I thought and said, well, it's even better because it's, it's less classical, it's less fictional. So um, we're about to jump in the Q&A. You all have incredible experiences all over the world, and the selfish question I wanted to ask is, like, what's the craziest, most terrible thing you got yourself into? I'm going out on an interview each, but like, ah, come on. You know you've got a good one. And I, I, well, it's, <clears throat> I've got a bunch. Ted's like, yeah, I got this. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we need like another hour at least. Um, but I'll just do one. Okay, so, because it's one of the more amusing ones. So I was uh, traveling with, a, with a, a buddy of mine who just came along for shits and giggles to uh, the Karakoram Highway, which connects Pakistan to uh, northern China. 
and it travels through, it goes through Ka the Pakistani section of Kashmir, which is disputed with India. And um, just as we, uh, we thought this, I was working on a uh, adventure travel piece about the world's most dangerous uh, highway, the highest altitude roadway in the world. Um, and it is a beautiful, stunning place, by the way. Uh, it's, you see snow leopards, it's 14 to 20,000 feet of, 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 of driving. It's stunning. Um, but anyway, um, little did we know we blundered into something called the Third Kashmir War, which is also known as the Cargill Conflict. And so it started while we were there. We just blundered into it. There was a, we um, went through a, a town that had just been the site of a battle, <clears throat> and we got stopped at a checkpoint at about 11 o'clock at night. And uh, these four Taliban uh, soldiers boarded, and they said, um, okay, they checked everyone's passports, and they're like, two Americans off. Now, the thing is, I have a French passport also, so I had that make that decision, like, how much do I like my friend? You know, and it's like, you know, I could just be like, je suis Francais. And then it's like, but I decided I liked my friend. So we got off together. And so they said, listen, um, you know, you, you're in Taliban territory um, and we're going to uh, execute you. So, um, you know, you have about five minutes. And I'm like, you know, why wait? But they're, uh, <laughs> anyway, so we start, so we're just, you know, at this point, I'm just like, you have to go. And so, the, um, the, so I'm like, wait a minute, we're not in Taliban territory. And they're like, you should have gone to the cyber cafe in, 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 uh, in Kashur. They would have told you that this is now Taliban territory. I'm like, so I'm arguing. We didn't, there's no cyber cafe. And they're like, the Lonely Planet guy says there's a, ca a cyber cafe. But the Lonely Planet guy is full of shit. There's no cy the cyber cafe. So I'm like arguing. Now, I should point out this whole time, my friend uh, is literally falling asleep. He's so bored by this whole prospect. So this goes on and on and on. And for, I'm like just basically arguing for our lives based on minutia for about an hour. And finally, I, I asked this guy, I'm like, you know, your, your English is great. Like, you know, where did you get your English? And he's like, oh, I'm NYU, class of 1983. I'm like, no shit. And then he, so we start talking, and then he's like, oh, so, uh, you know, who's your team? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, Yankees or Mets? And I, don't, I hate sports. I don't even watch, I, I never watch sports. But I figured, you know, Taliban guy is probably going to be a Mets guy. So, <laughs> so, so I go, I'm a Mets man all the way. And he's like, oh, yeah, like, totally. And so at that point, I realized we weren't going to die. And, um, and, uh, and so anyway, um, I get back on the bus, and my friend is, uh, I wake him up, and I go, hey, what, he goes, what happened? And I go, oh, we're, we're going to live. And he goes, oh, cool, and goes back to sleep. <laughs> so um, it was... But it was like, I mean, truly, truly, I mean, we really, I mean, it was very upsetting because I thought, you know, this is, the, this, is the, this is it, like, we're going to die here. Like, we're going to be one of those stories, like, that people, oh, that's interesting, and then you turn the page, and then that's it. And, like, and it's like, you're going to be in this lonely place where no one gives a shit about you, and you're just going to vanish off the face of the earth, and like, poof, and life will go on. And it's like, it's, it's creepy and eerie, and you feel like that. You know that that fear that goes like literally to your spine. It goes up your spine, and um, it's you know there's there's other moments like that. But I, th I thought there's something about the NYU thing that was hilarious. We've <laughs> got about two minutes left for questions. Oh, I, I I mean to when I was in the refugee camps um, in Greece. So there are two different camps, and one of them is really off limits, so you can't go in. Journalists are not allowed, press is not allowed, no one's allowed, basically. Um, but we wanted to, me and two other cartoonists wanted to do a story about that camp. So we just, um, we found some doctors that were working in the camp, they were Dutch. And we said, can we just go in with you and pretend we're doctors? <laughs> and um, of course, we're cartoonists, I don't know anything about uh, medical stuff. But they said, yeah, sure, let's, let's just try. Because um, they really were supportive of the idea of drawing uh, the inside of that camp. Because no one had ever taken any pictures of it. Um, so we went with them with the car towards the camp. And there was a hole in the fence that they would go through every morning. So they wouldn't have to pass the guards at all. But I, I really remember the way that she parked the car in front of the camp. Because she would go back and then turn around. And then in a very funny position would park the car. And I asked her, why, why are you parking the car like this? And she said, well, if someone comes after us, this is the fastest way to go. <laughs> and I really remember that. And so we went into that camp for a couple minutes, and we just looked around, and we tried to remember everything we saw, because we couldn't take any sketch pad with us. 
um, and later I made some notes of it. Um, it was pretty scary because that, that camp was run by the Greek army, so we, we really had to be careful. And the worst part of the story is that I didn't use that part in, in my final report at all. <laughs> so it was all in vain. <laughs> but it was exciting for sure. <laughs> Okay, we've got 10 minutes for questions. Um, if you want to, the microphone's on either side. Um, if nobody volunteers, I'm just going to keep asking the stuff I want to, but if you can step over there so that everybody can hear your question. Um, and then there's one there. Okay, how you doing? Yeah. Hi. I have a lot of opinions on sources and using quotes, and I won't bore you with all of those. Um, I, I'm actually really curious about the way that people recreate images because a lot of the time when we're talking about graphic reportage, we're not talking about people always using photo references in the way that Joe Sacco might, you know? So, like, how do you guys balance out, um, or do you have any kind of coding for things that you're drawing where you're showing things that you've actually seen, or things you have photos for that you took yourself, or things that are photos that other people have taken, or are basically um, reimagined? Um, well, hi, Ellery, <laughs> from hi. the NIV. Hi. Um, I uh, personally try to, I think there's like a certain level of visual verisimilitude that is like what I shoot for. Like I try to do a, like there's a very, very like low baseline in terms of like if it's winter on the East Coast and you're showing trees, they should not have like leaves on the trees for the most part. Like it should go from there up to like, the specific kind of brick on the building to make sure that it's right. And luckily, like, comic, comics is a language of abstraction, right? So if you don't really know what's going on in the background of an image, you can kind of have it fade into nothing, right? Like, um, for me personally, I try to show detail where I'm most confident about what's going on. Um, I don't know. You know, so for, in, for Guantanamo, we, we had quite a serious problem. Where we've not been to Guantanamo, obviously. And uh, there are, first, it's, it's a prison, and the prison is always quite monotonous, and in graphic novels you need some diversity. And um, third, uh, the pictures you have from Montenegro, they're a bit all the same. Uh, they're authorized, uh, they're staged, most of them. They've been also redacted. Uh, they're all like the official truth. And so we had to use them, but in the meantime, uh, revisit them. So we could do it thanks to the prisoner of Mohammed who, for instance, told us, no, actually, like, you know, this block, is, is, it's fake, it was not there, and it didn't look that clean. Or he was telling us, this picture with two Daytonese, without uh, chains, uh, chatting together in an open space. Maybe it happened after my release, but certainly not when I was there. So we, we changed, I mean, Alex wanted to re redraw half of the book, after mm -hmm. fact checking. And, and it, it's, it's also, well, it's like journalism, no? you often have to rewrite re your stuff as well. So he accepted the game, but it's certainly more difficult than, than fiction. And then I also agree that graphic novel is, is also good to avoid those kind of traps, especially uh, when in, in this kind of graphic novel, uh, it's much better when your style is not realistic. Because not only do you avoid the traps, you also you know, you can use a lot of ellipses and symbols to be accurate. You don't need to be too much into details as well. I agree with Jerome. I mean, uh, I think a non-realistic uh, drawing style is actually more powerful than a, a highly realistic um, drawing style, which fits well because I'm not talented enough to have a highly realistic drawing style. Well, it's true. I mean, you kind of avoid those, those dilemmas of, you know, uh, when you're having a truck driving by, do you need to draw like all the, like even the license plate and stuff, or do you just make it a box and that's it? I mean, then I think graphic journalism is perfect for that because some, you don't even need those details for the story. I think it's it's to totally useless. Who cares what a truck looks like? I mean, it has to be accurate, but I think a lot of details you don't even need to to get to the point of the story. Anybody else? There's video anyway. <laughs> it is recorded. Yeah. I wanted 
I came for Jerome because of the Guantanamo Bay okay comic, but then I found out that you did stuff on Snowden, so this is probably relevant to you as well. I wanted to know how all of you, as artists that cover political topics and journalists and publishers, feel about a general lack of solidarity from the media or talking about the situations of uh, Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, or Snowden right now, considering they, you know, release files on Guantanamo and you know, Haspel has been put in a position of power when she was found to have been part of that. And uh, just if you have any words of solidarity for them or what your feelings are on the situation right now. Gina Haspel should be in prison for the rest of her life. She's a torturer. She water, she super personally supervised the waterboarding at Guantanamo. And if she's guilty of war crime, she should be transferred to The Hague. She's a disgusting human being. I hope that's clear. Thank you. Um, and uh, in terms of Julian Assange, um, it is nothing short of repugnant how the media is sitting on their hands uh, uh, through this. I mean, reading the New York Times uh, op-ed page, for example, and having and reading how uh, you know these are the, they received they made money from Julian Assange. They they published his leaks, and they and you know they're they're, they're talking about how he treats his cat. Um, in, you know, it's Julian Assange is, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the issue of his, um, of the alleged, the sexual allegations in the Netherlands is something that's serious and he needs to address, but that is a separate issue. It is not related to the, the main issue of him. He is absolutely a publisher. He is absolutely a journalist. The fact that there are not daily protests with hundreds of thousands of Americans out in the streets is just a tribute to the fact that there is no left in this country at yeah. all, no organization, and um, it is sad, and it's, it, it's, it, I'm furious about it. Um, it's a difficult, well, it's a lot of difficult questions for me, because, first, because I'm, I'm, I'm not American, so my point of view is very personal, and I don't really realize how much media are doing their work on this or not, but I tend to agree with what you say on those, particular uh, persons, and in the book actually we used quite a lot, Wikileaks, so I would difficultly say it's not good material, because there are a lot of things I, I learned in small details, thanks to both the Guantanamo leaks and the cable leaks, pretty, pretty useful for, and even pretty useful for uh, helping Mohammed the, the, to, to prove his uh, innocence and, and but then, uh, well, for us, um, I'm, well, I'm really surprised. Uh, in fact, we, we didn't have, for instance, on the book, we didn't have that much media in, in France where it's been published. But well, I guess it's also because it's, it's France. Uh, I there's a lot of I'm curious there. to see how, if we will get a bit more media in the US or not. Uh, if maybe we will, and if we don't get it, is it because uh, it's French or is it because uh, there is much less interest now. But I also acknowledge that there, I mean, we're French, but there have been a lot of really, really good work on Bhutan by American journalists, activists, lawyers. I mean, most of the work has been done by Americans themselves, so it's not that legal, maybe. But then maybe it's also interesting to see uh, what is a non American point of view on it, and if it can be read as well and find an audience here. I'm, I'm curious to see that. Um, we're going to have to end it there. We're out of time. I just want to thank uh, Amy DeJong, Jerome Kubiana, Ted Rawl, and Josh Kramer all for being here. Uh, thank you guys all for being here. This was a fantastic discussion. Thanks, Andrew.